We was always treated as uh, second-class citizens by the way Lil Baker. She told me that they had to sit in the back and black people were not allowed to sit at the soda fountain. Look where we began and look where we are now. It's still work to be done, but a lot of things have changed for the better. Thank you for joining us for our Black History Month special. I'm Sade LeRae. And I'm Jarrell Baker. We're telling stories of our history and how they unite us today. We're standing here at the campus of the original Paul Quinn College in Waco. It was the first historically black college in the state of Texas. And at one point, it was the only college black students were allowed to attend. And as an HBCU graduate myself, knowing that part of history is significant. The journey and the path that we took from segregation to integration is an integral part of our community. Integrating schools was a slow process here in Waco. In 1954, the Supreme Court outlawed segregation in public schools. But it wasn't until the early 70s that schools in Central Texas fully integrated. And one of those schools was A.J. Moore High School. Now, it was the first all-black high school here in Waco following the Civil War and was also named after a professor here at Paul Quinn. Now, that school shut down in 1971 due to segregation. I spoke with some of the graduates of that school talking about how they want to keep their legacy alive for generations to come. You wouldn't want to miss school because... You can have so much fun in school, <laughs> you know, than being in school. You can be sick. I'm going to school. Timeless photos and precious memories. This is me when, when we was doing uh, homecoming, <laughs> homecoming week. <laughs> Not much is left to remember Waco's first black high school following the Civil War. It was amazing to be a part of that and knowing that I was there. Years ago, this area here off of University Parks Drive and Clay Avenue once belonged to A.J. Moore High School, educating more than 4,000 students, many graduating and continuing on to successful careers. This is Eddie Bernice Johnson, a member of Congress. Linda Chappelle Beffley attended A.J. Moore during the late 1960s. But that she is right there. Yep, that's me. She says A.J. Moore was a safe space and a pillar for the black community at a time our country was deeply divided. Whether it be basketball, football, the community came out and to support. During her sophomore year, all that changed. After nearly a century, A.J. Moore closed its doors in 1971. A.J. Moore is gone. You know, this was like burying someone. In 1972, Waco ISD opened Jefferson Moore High School, one of the first integrated schools in the city. I think it's a burden because the way they just took away the school and made it another name. Linda and her Jefferson Moore classmate, Daryl Cobb, says it felt like they were forced into situations no one wanted. It started out real ugly. Yeah, it did. You know, we're talking about fights. Okay. Uh, you know, we don't want you at our school. Go back to your school. But the class of 74 graduates says the tensions only lasted for a semester. We started talking to one another, and that made the difference. We didn't have our parents or the principals. We built those relationships with each other. The wall shattered and the two sides became one. It was a family thing. It was just like a, every day was a happy day. Every day. Like A.J. Moore, Jefferson Moore closed down in 1987. After the school was consolidated, along with two other high schools to form the current Waco High School. The two alums say that even though their beloved school is no more, its legacy will never be forgotten. It's still work to be done, but a lot of things have changed for the better. Thank you, Jarrell. Well, other area black students also attended G.W. Carver High School before integration. And although we're standing in front of the new middle school today, this building was built off culture and community pride, pillars that the alumni say they cherish today. <laughs> Flipping through yearbooks <laughs> never gets old for this group of G.W. Carver graduates. Black and white photos telling a story of a time much different from today. There's a lot of people that didn't know that Carver was a high school. Carver was the, it was the hub of East Waco. The more people came, the more we got, the better we got, and, and uh, we just kind of loved the experience. All of our teachers tried to make sure that they prepared us for the future because they knew the integration was coming. 
and eventually it did. In 1970, the doors at GW Carver High School closed. Television newspaper said that Carver would be shut down. We would be bused to La Vega High School. It was very crushing to our class because we had been together 11 years. But students, not the only ones, impacted. The principal called me in and I thought it was in August, so I thought we were getting ready to start school here at Carver. And he said, no, La Vega has decided to integrate. Since you were the last one hired, you will go to a white school, an elementary school. I went home and cried because I've never been around that many uh, white people. Most of the graduates I spoke to graduated before integration, but their lives were still impacted in some way. Big order to him, everybody was just spilling their guts. Delano Naylor was a part of the last official class to graduate Carver High School before it closed. But leading up to his senior year, he participated in integrated focus groups at Baylor University. Most of the black kids said, I could take you home and meet my family. There were no white kids said that we could go to their house. Zero. Dozens of yearbooks later, this group hopes that all of Carver's history will never be forgotten. I'm glad to say that I was there when Mr. Lee came and got the band together, when Miss Doris Day came and she got the choir together. We excel at everything. I mean, I'm, I'm, this is bragging, but it's still fact. Well, after GW Carver High School closed its doors, it was later reclaimed before a fire damaged the building in 2021. And now students know it today as GW Carver Middle School. And Charter, you know, a very notable Carver High School alumni, former NFL linebacker Rodrigo Barnes. Now, Shaji Adam has more on his story and his impact on and off the field. I'm Shaji Adam reporting in Waco and on these grounds, Rodrigo Barnes started his legendary football career. Barnes did pass away last year, and during that time, I was able to speak to family members and friends that will carry on his legacy. Rodrigo Barnes attended Carver High School when it was once an all-black school, and his football play earned him a scholarship to Rice University, where he became one of the first black athletes to play for the Rice Owls. We had four individuals, very varied backgrounds, come together in the span of just a few days, become friends for life. And uh, to me, then and of itself is what it's all about, you know, Whenever I get through talking to Roy, we'd sign off, love you, man, and meant it, and didn't care who heard it. So that was, that's, that's what I'm going to miss. I have nobody to talk to about that now. Barnes' talent got him to the NFL where he was drafted by the Cowboys and was a Super Bowl champion with the Raiders in 1977. But at the end of the day, there was more to Barnes than the gridiron. Some of the stuff I read about him, I can't believe it. When I hear stories from Drew Pearson, when I hear stories from uh, some of the fellow uh, the Rice 4, the first that integrated Rice, I can't believe that was my dad. I want him, you guys remember him as the activist, strength, and um, I'm going to miss him because it's like I don't have anybody to be proud of me anymore. Barnes had a career that left a mark in not just Waco, but in the entire nation. Reporting in Waco, I'm Shaji Adam. Brocktail ISD is honoring one woman who helped integrate schools. I'm Brianna Smith, your neighborhood reporter, meeting with her granddaughter to explore her legacy. Tamara Powell's grandmother was more than just a beloved family member. Susie Sampson Piper was a key figure in integrating Rockdale schools. And now she's getting the recognition Powell says is long overdue. Sampson Piper was born in Rockdale in 1921 and attended Acock High School, the city's only black school. After graduating from college, she came back to teach, eventually becoming principal. Her family says she fought for equal treatment of black students to that of their white peers and connected cultures once schools integrated in the late 1960s. But it was equally hard on her. She made great friends um, and people that she kept in contact with throughout her life that were colleagues. But then there were the teachers that never accepted her because she was black um, or that used the N-word. 
um, on a regular basis. And so those were the things that hurt and cut deep. She journaled these feelings in handwritten notes she left behind after her death in 2019. Now the school is honoring her impact for its distinguished alumni program. We've got some really, really wonderful people that have graduated and have made wonderful careers for themselves. And so it's, it brings back lots of talent to our town and gives the, our students an opportunity to learn. You know, I wish that my grandmother was here to see it and to hear it because she would often remark, I don't know what I've done, you know, or, um, you know, what have I done to impact my students? And I see it every day and people that remember her. If you would like to learn more about Sansom Piper's legacy, you can look forward to the release of Powell's book in the spring. Reporting in Rockdale, Brianna Smith. And we're just getting started. We're continuing to tell stories about local heroes who made their mark in Central Texas. Not just here at home, their legacies making a lasting impact across our country. Stay with us. A hero of World War II, Waco native Doris Miller was the first African American to be awarded the Navy Cross for his bravery in Pearl Harbor. He's actually wearing that medal right here on this statue at the Doris Miller Memorial. Our Adam Schindler shares a story on how the U.S. Navy is still honoring his name today. The sailor who fought back. I'm Adam Schindler, your neighborhood reporter for Fort Cavazos, and I am here at the Dory Miller Gate at the Waco VA, one of many memorials to his name, marking his heroism on December 7th, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. When Imperial Japan launched their attack on Pearl Harbor, only one person sprang into action against the planes bombarding the American fleet. Mess Attendant 2nd Class Dory Miller of Waco, Texas. Eyewitnesses said he carried wounded sailors to safety before shooting down multiple planes. He was the first black sailor to ever earn the Navy Cross. Two years later, he was killed in a torpedo attack in the Battle of Macon Island. Despite Miller's heroic actions that day, he never earned the Congressional Medal of Honor. Some are still fighting to get Dory that recognition, like his relative, Betty Beard. Look at his heroic acts and grant him the medal based on his heroic act. But Miller is being honored in another way. He is the only enlisted sailor to have an aircraft carrier bearing his name. It's the Navy's most advanced and costliest ship, totaling $12.9 billion. The USS Dory Miller is planned to enter service in 2032. Thank you, Adam. Well, Central Texas recently lost two trailblazers the Honorable Eddie Bernice Johnson and County Commissioner Patricia Miller. Now, before making their mark in the political world, these two grew up right here in Waco. Chantel Belafonte has her story. I'm standing in the church where two prominent African-American women helped to shape the city of Waco. I'm Chantal Belafonte, your neighborhood reporter in Waco. Patricia Chisholm Miller and Eddie Bernice Johnson both grew up in Tolver Chapel Missionary Baptist Church. The pastor of the church tells me about the strong influence Miller had on the community and continues to have in Waco. To everybody in our congregation, she was just pat. They all refer to her as Pat. The pastor of Tolver Chapel Missionary Baptist Church says former McLennan County Commissioner Patricia Chisholm Miller was a force of light inside and outside of church. She did not carry an air when she was, was with church or even in community with persons that she was just who she was. But yet she was still as commissioner who she was, but yet she was still Pat. Miller is known for working to make positive change in her community. Miller was the first African American woman to be elected commissioner. I don't, I don't think you can uh, get, you can't move into arenas like that unless you really had a solid foundation. I think their family foundations really enable them to be set apart. A young Eddie Bernice Johnson developed her roots inside the same church. She would inspire Miller to achieve great things. What I have gleaned uh, from her is it doesn't take um, being emotionally absorbed in an issue 
in order to be passionate and advocate for it. Johnson was a Waco native representing Dallas in the U.S. House of Representatives for 30 years before her death late last year. I think Commissioner Miller um, appreciated those moments that she had opportunity to share with Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. And I think, I think even watching her probably gave her that, that drive. A drive inspiring young black women for generations to come. She was a change. I mean, she was a change maker. The legacy of Miller and Johnson still lives on to this day. They were committed to making a change in Waco to provide a better tomorrow for residents. I'm Chantal Belafonte reporting in Waco. For decades, the Dr. Pepper Museum entertained and educated the masses on its popular soda brand. But after the break, we're sharing the stories behind the not so sweet history of segregation at the soda fountain. We're standing here at Bridge Street in Waco, where this was a gathering spot for black professionals in the civil rights era. It also served as a hub for black owned businesses. And beyond Bridge Street, there are many places where African Americans were not welcome and faced extreme discrimination, including one place, Waco's very own Dr. Pepper factory. Our Lauren Adams shares the story. The Dr. Pepper Museum is not shying away from those stories of discrimination. In fact, they're honoring those tales with an exhibit here at the museum. I had the chance to talk to the curator of that exhibit and a man whose mother experienced that discrimination. Anthony Betters knows how blacks were treated in Waco during the civil rights movement. My mother worked on Austin Avenue at a store called McCory's to where she told me that they had to sit in the back and black people were not allowed to sit at the soda fountain. That story right there is why the Dr. Pepper Museum created this exhibit called Sit Down to Take a Stand, showing videos when blacks across the country would sit at lunch counters demanding acceptance during the civil rights movement. The exhibit shows videos of black Americans sitting down at lunch counters and soda fountains where they were not welcome and enduring people pouring ketchup and mustard on top of them and pulling them off their stools. So they, they went through resistance training. They trained how to take a blow, how to take a cigarette burn, how to take being spat on. In the exhibit video, Waco native and World War II veteran Arthur Fred Joe Sr. shares his story. He talks about finally being able to get service. Uh, one day and what that was like. This exhibit isn't the only piece of black history in the museum. They also honor a man by the name of Ellis Booker, the first black man to work for Dr. Pepper, an employee for more than 50 years. I remember when the KKK. A cutout of him tells a story of the KKK demanding Booker be fired or face retaliation. And he endured a lot and he persevered through a lot of different difficulties that's even unimaginable even to talk about. As for the exhibit, it has done what they had hoped, created a lot of conversation around black history. And the soda fountain was themed 1950s, but they have since changed that to 1960s to be more inclusive. In Waco, I'm Lauren Adams. Coming up, uncovering the untold history at Baylor. We hear from students as the university breaks around on a memorial to enslaved people. You know, I've met students that have left because they didn't feel like they were represented on campus. Although Bailey University helped spearhead desegregation here in Waco, they didn't start admitting black undergrads until 1964. And today they're acknowledging the enslaved people who helped lay the foundation for the school. Our Dominique Lay has that story. Honoring the untold stories. I'm Dominique Lay, your neighborhood reporter in Waco. I'm at Baylor, where university leaders and students came together for a groundbreaking of a monument representing the unknown enslaved gaps in Baylor's history. Knowing that Baylor was built you know, with the hard work of slaves, it's definitely sometimes a little bit harder to come here knowing that. For 117 years, Baylor University denied access to black students. It wasn't until the 1960s when that started to change, and now Baylor University leaders are acknowledging the school's history. Their investment in the founding of this university has provided, the, it provided infrastructure and provided resources that allow us to be where we are here today. 
the roles of slaves who helped build and create years of wealth for the school. But we recognized that we had not done a good job of telling the complete story of who was involved in the founding about their role in chattel slavery. To honor those unknown enslaved people, ground was broken for a memorial that will lie in the middle of campus at Founders Mall. So because Christians played such a role in the justification and mobilization of slavery, we have a unique, we have a unique, a unique responsibility and opportunity to bear witness to the fact that actually racialized chattel slavery is deeply incompatible with the Christian faith. With leaders digging into Baylor's history. They're taking the next step to just show that, hey, we know this happened. We don't want to ignore it. And we want to, you know, in some ways apologize that that happened, but also encourage, like, that this can still be a home for you despite what happened in the past. They realize the only way forward is acknowledging the past. Hey, these are the things that we never want to be involved in ever again. Here are the ways that we can build now to make sure that to make sure that that doesn't happen. Back in 2020, Baylor students protested and demanded that the school remove statues and landmarks with connections to slavery. Baylor promised to look into the issue. Then in 2021, a study commissioned by the school recommended changing buildings and statues that honor slave owners. But it gave a pass to one of the school's founders, Robert E.B. Baylor. In 2022, the Board of Regents approved a plan to change the name of the quad and move the statue of another founder, Rufus Burleson. But the Robert Baylor statue stayed in place. They also promised to add elements to provide a better representation of Baylor's history, like the monument to the unknown enslaved. Students I spoke with told me they wish they had a class here teaching them more about Baylor's black history. The monument is set for a ribbon cutting summer 2025. Your neighborhood reporter in Waco, I'm Dominique Lay. Well, that'll do it for our Black History Month special. We hope that these stories inspire you or educate you in some way. Remember, you can find the full special over on our website, kxxv.com. Thank you so much for joining us.